Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to continue learning Golem Arcana by Harebrained Schemes. If you haven't already, go back and watch the first video in this series where I explain how the technology of the game works, because in this episode, we're going to focus solely on the rules and how you play the game. So join me at the table, and let's get started. Golem Arcana is scenario-driven. When you go to play, you're going to pick from a growing list of scenarios provided by the application. Let's say we wanted to choose the starter game. Now it's going to indicate whether we'll be using fixed armies, as we are here, or allow you to bring your own personally crafted armies to the table. Either way, it will also indicate which map tiles you'll be using. In a future video, we'll go over how to create your own custom armies, but for now, this is a nice scenario to start with. This scenario will also explain what the players need to do in order to win, the length of the game, and where to deploy your armies and any other special items. Like these mana wells that I've put in the indicated positions, players should also put out any appropriate cards, the dice if they plan to use them, and any additional tokens that are needed. The game is played over a series of rounds, which are broken into a turn for each player. At the start of your turn, the application is going to perform an upkeep phase, and here it will resolve things like ongoing damage to golems, harvesting mana wells, and cooldown. Cooldown is a very important part of the game, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Once the upkeep phase is complete, then the player will receive a number of action points that they can spend on their golem's abilities. The number of action points that you receive is going to be based on the army point value, or size of the army, as dictated by the scenario. For example, this is a 500 or less army point scenario, so the players will get 6 action points per turn, as we see right here. Larger armies will get more. For example, if your army is 501 to 1000 points, you get 8 action points, and so on. However, in a given scenario, players will have equal action point pools. You can spend your pool of action points on just one golem, or spread them out as you see fit. The abilities on a golem's card are broken into these various widgets. The value on the left side is the base cost in action points to activate that ability. The main golem actions are divided into movement abilities, which are shown here on the left, and attack abilities, which are on the right. Some abilities are passive, which means that they're always in effect and don't cost anything. For example, on the back of the Winged Preserver, we have a passive ability which is listed here at the top. You'll also find the unit's attacks listed once again with their stats, but also additional text. These usually indicate special abilities or effects that also come into play when using this attack. Once you've used all your action points for a turn or no longer have actions that you want to take, your turn is over, which you indicate to the application by tapping on the end turn text, which is here on the control card. If you have any unused action points at the end of your turn, then they will be converted into mana, which we'll talk about later. At the start of your next turn, you'll get your full allowance of action points to use again. Now, I mentioned that each of a golem's abilities has a base action point cost. But you also have to imagine that each time you use an ability, it heats up. There's a, a magical exertion that needs to cool down. Now, you can use the ability before it has fully cooled down, but if you do so, the action point cost is going to double each time, and it's going to take longer for the ability to cool down back to its normal, cheaper cost. Let's say, for example, I wanted to move my sand lion. I will tap on its movement ability here. On the screen, we can see that the application is showing us that this is going to cost one action point. Let's say that I want to move to this position. I'll tap there and confirm. Now I move my model to that area. If I wanted to walk again, you'll see on screen now, it's saying that the walk ability costs two action points. So I'll select it and then I'll move again. Let's say I want to go here. I'll confirm this movement. And now you can see that if I want to walk another time, it's going to cost me four action points. And I don't have four action points. If I try to select this option, it says on screen here, cannot afford, not enough action points. 
you can see as I've been taking these actions, my action point pool, which is shown here, has been reducing. If you look here on screen, you're gonna see the cooldown points that have been accumulating. When you first use a movability, it gains one point of cooldown. And then each time you move after that, it gains an additional point of cooldown. Attack actions work the exact same way. If you use it more than once, its action point costs start to double until you let it fully cool down. There is one important difference though. When you first use an attack action, it gains two cooldown points and then one cooldown point for each additional use. But keep in mind, at the start of each player's turn, during that upkeep phase that I talked about, the application is going to automatically remove one cooldown point from each of your golem's abilities. So if you think about it that way, if I had only moved the sand lion once, it would have gained one cooldown point. Then at the start of my next turn, that cooldown point would have been removed. So then the cost to move the sand lion would only be one action point once again. Now, because I moved it twice, it has two cooldown points. So at the start of my next turn, one will be removed and one will remain. So then if I want to use the sand lion to move again, the action point cost is still going to be four, which is a big part of your six action points. So one of the things you have to judge is when it's a good idea to maybe use an attack more than once or a movement more than once to gain an advantage, knowing that the cost of using that ability again is going to be much, much higher. Let's talk about the rules for movement. We know the cost of the movement is shown on the left, and once activated, the golem will get a number of movement points equal to the value shown on the immediate right. If you see four arrows around the golem's movement value, then it can move forward, backwards, left or right, but not diagonally. If you see eight arrows, like here, then the unit is nimble and can move diagonally as well. So when this unit flies, it can't move diagonally, but if it walks, it can. Your available movement points get reduced each time your golem moves to an adjacent space. Spaces are also known in the game as regions. Moving into a plane or shallow water or ground cover space costs one movement point. Going to elevated terrain or a space with deep water, medium cover, or obstructions costs two points. If a space has blocking terrain, like this one here, then it cannot be moved to or through. Now, if you're ever unsure of what type of terrain a space is, just point at it with your stylus. Here we can see that we're looking at deep water. This one comes up as shallow water. If you're moving a golem that is flying, then it only costs one movement point for each region that you enter, regardless of the terrain type. And remember, the application is gonna handle all of this for you. When you move a golem, it's gonna highlight all of the spaces you can legally move to. But it's sometimes nice to know the rules that the application is following so that you have a better sense of how the game works and also how to plan out future turns. If you enter a space with an enemy unit, then you must end your movement. Now, you can use a movement action to leave a space with an enemy but it's going to cost you an extra action point to break away. Also, each golem's base has a size ranking. War sprites and ogres are a size one, titans are a size two, and a colossus is a size four. Each space can contain a total of four base sizes in it. So as an example, I could have this war sprite, titan, and ogre in this space, but no more whereas a Colossus takes up the entire space all on its own. This is important because you cannot move into or through a space that is fully occupied like these two are. Some spaces have obstacles like this region does. The obstacle is shown here. Each obstacle subtracts one from the available space. So at most, we could have, for example, a Titan and an Ogre in this region. A little later, we'll see how a golem could use the ability to charge to move into a full region. Now let's discuss combat. There are two main types of attacks. Melee, which shows this fist symbol, and ranged attacks that show the lightning bolt. The first value here is the number of action points you need to spend to activate the attack. The next number is the accuracy. This is a value out of 100 that you need to roll less than or equal to to hit your target. And then this is the damage that you'll do if your attack is successful. And finally, the range. Now, if it is a melee attack, 
there will be no range. Instead, you must be in the same region or space as your target. If it is a ranged attack, you cannot target a unit in the same space as you, but it still must be within this number of spaces away. Many attacks will have additional effects that resolve, and these are listed on the back of the unit's card beside the unit's statistics. As we mentioned, many of the attacks will have additional effects that also resolve, and these are listed with the attack on the back of the unit's card and will be managed by the application. To start combat, you must be able to target your enemy. Again, for a melee attack, this means being in the same space as your target. So the Sand Lion could do a melee attack against the Winged Preserver. But let's say the Dune Viper wanted to do a ranged attack against the Winged Preserver. For ranged combat, you need to be within range and have unblocked line of sight to your target. You check this by drawing an imaginary line from the center of the space you're in to the center of the space the target is in. The line may not pass through blocked or elevated terrain or a region containing a colossus. In this situation, the line passes by, touches the corner of, but does not go through these raised terrain spaces. So we do have line of sight and the attack has a range of two. The target is two spaces away, we're all set. And remember, the application is going to take care of all of this for us. Once I select the spiked volley ranged attack of the Dune Viper and then point at my target, the application will highlight the target's base in red if it's a valid target, which, as we suspected, it is. Now we need to determine the value that we have to roll equal to or less than in order to succeed in hitting our target. We do this by looking at the base accuracy value of the attack. In this case, it's 75. But that's not all. We also have to compare this against the dodge value of our target. And the value that you see there, in this case 8, needs to be subtracted from this original value. So now instead of needing 75 or less, we're going to need 67 or less. You also have to take into account the type of terrain that your target is standing in. If your target is surrounded by trees, it's going to be harder for you to hit it. The table on screen shows the appropriate modifiers that terrain provides. These are values you would subtract from your accuracy. And it will depend on the size of the unit that's being attacked. The larger the golem you're attacking, the less that cover obscures it. In this case, our wing preserver is standing in a flat space that's providing no cover. But if it had been here, this provides medium cover. And we would subtract five from the accuracy of the Dune Viper's attack. But if you are conducting a ranged attack, for each space your line of sight passes through that could provide cover to your target, it also reduces the accuracy by half of its normal cover value. So we said five points would be subtracted from the accuracy if the Titan had been in this space. The line of sight is only passing through this space, so half of this is subtracted. Half of 5 is 2.5, but you round down. So 2 points will be subtracted from the accuracy. Again, the application is going to take care of all of this for us. Looking on screen right now, we can see our accuracy is 65. This is what we have to roll equal to or less than. But now we know where this number came from. You'll notice the icon down here says that we can tap both the select and page button together to receive more information. And if we look up here at the accuracy, we see we started with 75. We lost 8 points from the dodge of our target and then 2 more points from our line of sight passing through medium cover to give us this final value of 65. So now we both understand what the app is doing and can do the calculations ourselves. Going back to this screen, we see the value here that shows the damage we'll do to our target if our attack is successful. So where did this number come from? It starts with the base damage of the attack shown here of 28. But then you subtract the armor value of your target, which is 14. 28 take away 14 leaves 14. So on a successful hit, the wing preserver's total hit points of 100 will be reduced by 14. A golem that is reduced to zero hit points is destroyed 
and then removed from the game. All that's left now is to confirm the attack and roll our results. We'll do this by pressing the confirm button. On screen, you see the value we rolled was 82. In order to succeed in hitting my target, I needed 65 or less. And you can see on screen, our target is still at a full 100 hit points. So if you roll equal to or less than the modified accuracy value, it's a hit. And if you roll higher, it's a miss. Unless you roll doubles, because doubles always hit. So if instead of rolling 82, I had rolled 88, which is a double, I would have hit and done 14 points of damage to the winged preserver, even though I rolled higher than my accuracy value. Now, if you roll doubles equal to or less than the accuracy value, it's a critical hit. Then you do full damage plus another half. So in this case, 1.5 times the spiked volley damage of 28 is 42. And then you subtract the wing preserver's armor of 14 for 28 final points of damage. And if you roll double zeros, you do damage and a half, plus your attack does not accumulate any cooldown. Now there's another kind of attack known as an area effect attack. This will target a space and all of the units found there, including friendly ones. The application will calculate accuracies for each of the targeted units separately. But area effect attacks ignore cover, both from the targeted space and any of the intervening spaces. You still only roll to attack once, but whatever you roll is then compared against the calculated accuracies. Units with melee attacks, like this Dune Viper, have a special way of executing them, known as charging. To do this, you target an enemy outside of your space, but within the movement points allowed by your movement ability, as long as the target is in a full space. The action point cost will be that of your movement plus the melee attack, and both of them will accumulate cooldown. If the attack hits, it does damage as normal, and if the target is the same size or smaller than the attacker, the target is displaced, and that means it gets moved to an adjacent space. So a successful charge against this jeweled harpy would move it out of the space it was in. Whereas a successful charge against the winged preserver wouldn't move it, but it would still do damage to it. If the attack does critical damage, the target is displaced regardless of its size. So on a good roll, the Dune Viper could push out this winged preserver. Whether the attack succeeds or fails, the attacking unit is then placed in the space where the target had been. Now, if the space is too full, let's say, for example, we had failed to hit, then you move your unit to the closest available space. As always, the application will guide you through all the steps of resolving the charge, including the correct placement of golems. Along with action points, there's another type of resource in the game known as mana, and you can collect this in a few different ways. When one of your golems is destroyed, you will generally get 20% of it and its knight's army point value back to you in the form of mana. And if you end your turn without using all of your action points, the remaining action points will be converted into mana. If a scenario includes mana wells, they're represented by these tokens, which will start the game on their full side as opposed to their depleted side. The scenario will specify the capacity of a well, which can vary, but is typically six mana per side. If you're on a space with a well, and there's no enemies there, then during your upkeep phase, your golem harvests mana from that well based on the amount dictated by the scenario, which again, in this case, would be six mana. The application will add this to your mana pool automatically. A golem always fully harvests the side of the mana well it is on. The size of the golem doesn't cause it to harvest more or less. You then flip the well over, and the next time you harvest, you will get the same value of mana again. And then, it's removed from the board. An important use of mana is drawing on the powers of the Ancient Ones, which you will select when building your army. The powers they provide can be accessed by tapping here. On screen, we now see the two Ancient Powers that came with this pre-made army. Using the Page button, I can cycle through each of these different powers and see the abilities that they provide. 
Some powers will target a specific location, giving it either a blessing or a curse, and you can use these tokens to place on the board to act as a reminder. You'll notice that Ancient One powers are paid for using mana that you've collected. When building an army, you'll be able to choose from a variety of knights that will pilot your golems. The details of a knight are found by tapping here on a unit's card. When you're building your army, you'll pick one of a variety of different knights to place into each of your golems, and some of them will have special abilities, like the one you see on screen. This is a passive ability, and it will always be available to use. Whereas the knight that's in the Devil Jin has a cost to use the special ability. That cost could be either action points, mana, or even taking hit points from its golem. In this case, this is the symbol for a mana cost, so you'd have to pay five mana to use this ability. Finally, we have relics. These are powerful magic items that can be carried into battle. And these come with expansion sets. When you include one in your army, you assign it to a golem. There may be size restrictions to the item, and the app will guide you there. And those are the rules that govern the game. Now, one of the unique features of Golem Arcana is that the application can be updated, so some of the rules may change slightly over time, but the general principles should stay the same. So if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. And I hope you'll stick around, because in a future episode, I'm going to show you how to build a custom army from scratch, and then we're going to play a full game that you can participate in and really get a sense of how this all comes together. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.